Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Reaching Higher New Hampshire's briefing on the minimum standards for public school approval. We're going to start right on time this afternoon because we have a lot of information we wish to share with each of you and want to respect everybody's time um, at this moment. So we're going to go ahead and begin. This briefing is taking place as the New Hampshire Education Department has proposed an overhaul to the minimum standards for public school approval, also known as the ED-306s. Their proposed overhaul could radically change our state's public schools. The purpose of this webinar is to get into some of those changes. But first, let's share a little bit about reaching higher New Hampshire. Reaching Higher's mission is to provide New Hampshire children with the opportunity to prepare for college, for immediate careers, and for the challenges and opportunities of life in the 21st century by serving as the state's education policy resource center and community engagement resource for New Hampshire families, New Hampshire educators, and elected officials. Our founding belief that grounds our work is that our public schools are an essential public good and they thrive when they are supported by their communities and our state. Our work leads this critical statewide dialogue to improve educational outcomes for young people by grounding the debate in research, framing core issues to increase accessibility, highlighting the urgency of the moment and unifying stakeholders around equity, driving the desire and capacity for positive change with our public schools. With that ground setting about reaching higher New Hampshire, I wanna speak a bit about the minimum standards for public school approval. New Hampshire's minimum standards are administrative rules that implement key parts of education law. When it comes to laws and regulations in New Hampshire, often legislators pass relatively broad laws that outline what they want to happen. Then they direct state agencies, and in this case, the New Hampshire Education Department, to cre create rules on how to implement those laws. Rules have the same effect as laws, but tend to be more detailed. Administrative rules are specifically designed to bring clarity to laws, fostering consistent implementation, no matter the location. So think of laws as a coloring page and think of the rules as the colors on that page. Together, they create a holistic picture. The minimum standards are rules that give education laws their color. They govern all public schools in New Hampshire and are designed to set standards and limits so that all public schools are operating within the same framework. In effect, it means that students are receiving comparable educational experiences regardless of their community, regardless of where they live. They guarantee all students a baseline to a quality, rigorous public education. The minimum standards also have a pretty broad scope. And we feel to set the context today, we really need to highlight that scope of these standards. The minimum standards are essential and comprehensive in the topics they cover. You can see here that they have vast implications and deal with everything from required school board policies to public school staff qualifications along the mandatory school year, amongst other topics. There have been many changes or revisions to these rules over the years. One of the most recent changes that we've been able to track in the minimum standards for public school approval is around remote learning. And that's right, remote learning resides in our minimum standards. So this slide really paints a broad picture of the elements these standards speak to. And now that we've set some ground or, or set the table for what the minimum standards are, we want to speak a little bit about the process to overhaul these standards. To date, 
There has been a long process, which actually began in 2020. But for the purposes of today's briefing and appreciating everybody's time, we are going to begin our focus of the process in 2022. And that is in mid-2020. Reaching higher, New Hampshire obtained a first draft of the rule proposal. Our organization immediately raised concerns in that 2022 proposal that those standards at the time would dilute and undermine public schools as we know them here in New Hampshire. Despite those concerns, the New Hampshire Education Department presented that draft to the State Board in March 2023. Ultimately, that draft was tabled so that a contractor could host listens, listening sessions, which they did for several months. The contractor and others heard hundreds, numerous of voices, echo the same concerns that Reaching Higher raised in 2022. And that bit of history brings us to now, February 2024. Just a few weeks ago, or about a month ago, the New Hampshire Education Department presented a new initial proposal to the State Board of Education. Despite the board's directive of listening to the public, the New Hampshire Education Department submitted a version that was similar to the March 2023 version and appears to double down on those efforts and those concerns that dismantle public education. This suggests that the New Hampshire Education Department didn't take into account public feedback, nor recommendations from their contractor who had been working with work groups and the public for much of 2023. It is also critical to know in this process to date and going forward that the New Hampshire Education Department has the final say in what the draft will be. Which brings us to now. The State Board of Education has approved the New Hampshire Education Department's initial proposal dated February 15th, 2024. This presentation will unpack Reaching Higher New Hampshire's analysis and findings based on the proposal dated February 14th. And on that, I'm going to pass the presentation along to my colleague, Christina Petorius. Thanks so much, Nicole. Um, it is great to be here. Thank you, everyone, for joining us on this absolutely critical topic. Um, so to start, we wanted to talk about the broad brushstrokes, and then we'll go into more detail. But in our analysis, we've been reading them for weeks now. Our findings indicate that the New Hampshire Department of Education's proposed overhaul presents a vastly different vision for New Hampshire's public schools one that de-emphasizes teaching and instruction in order to move towards the, quote, facilitation of learning, replacing instruction and courses with learning opportunities, eliminating class size requirements, and changing course mandates, among several other changes. These language changes are absolutely critical. The rules are a baseline for all public schools, and ambiguity in the rules could mean unequal application and could mean a vastly different experience depending on a student's zip code. And since these are the rules that implement key education laws, namely RSA 193E, there could be school funding implications, which is critical considering that the state is undergoing two different lawsuits having to do with school funding in the state. So Reaching Higher has distilled this, this analysis to five key themes, redefining the purpose and structure of school, of what public school actually is in the state, two, hollowing out instructional requirements, three, the removal of local authority, four, lawmaking through rules, and five, potential school funding implications. So in the next couple of slides, we're going to go through in depth what exactly that means and where exactly you can find it 
in the February 2024 initial proposal that was published by the State Board of Education. So when you see page numbers, those are going tr to track directly with that PDF that was published by the State Board of Education and the Department of Education. So you can follow along. In addition, we really wanted to show how these changes might impact schools here in New Hampshire. We really wanted to ground this in what it could actually look like. So, so in order to kind of bring that to life, we're going to navigate each theme through the lens of two students, Jack and Mia. Jack attends a rural high school in New Hampshire, one that is underfunded by the state, but whose community really rallies behind it to see it succeed. Mia attends a well-funded suburban high school, one that has a lot of resources. She has access to a lot of different courses. She took a field trip to Europe last year. And so, you know, we're, these are two very different school districts. They are both, both of their communities are very dedicated to the success of their students and are really committed to their public schools. But we wanted to show kind of both of these different scenarios to show that, you know, these rules will impact every school district in the state, regardless of how well they're resourced, regardless of, you know, their location and those kinds of things. And so we're really hoping that these examples can sort of bring to life and really ground some of these changes. So to begin, our first key takeaway is the redefining the purpose and structure of a public school. We see this in a number of different areas, starting with the removal of the term courses and programs and replacing it with learning opportunities, which are not defined, they're very vague. Um, we also see it in another interesting change that school boards must offer credit regardless of a student's enrollment status. This particular change raises a number of questions when taken into account the change to learning opportunities. Some of those questions are, you know, will a school board have to award credit even if the student is not enrolled? Does this open the door to part-time student enrollment and what does that mean? And what does this mean for schools, for districts, for students? So what does this change look like for Jack and for Mia? Well, for Jack, it could mean a cut in programs due to budget constraints. You know, in this scenario, his Jack school board relies on online, quote, learning opportunities, unquote. But Jack is struggling because he doesn't have a teacher that he can go to when he has a question about the recorded lesson. So, you know, where, 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 where the rules are changing from courses, where they have to offer courses, they have to offer those programs. Now it's to learning opportunities. Their school board interpreted in a certain way where now those, now those kind of core courses are offered through those online learning opportunities and there's no one there to personally support Jack in his education. In Mia's town, it could mean that three learning co-ops recently opened and they're selling credit bearing experiences. In Mia's school, it means that her school has to award credit for those experiences, even though they don't match the rigor of her high school's classes. It raises questions from parents and from businesses about the rigor of her high school's actual diploma. I'm gonna hand it off to Nicole to go over a couple of the other key takeaways. Thank you, Christina. Um, so I'm going to walk our audience through themes two, three, and four, and then we'll, we'll pass the rest of the presentation off to Christina um, for the afternoon. So theme two speaks to the hollowing out of instructional requirements. And we see this theme manifest in a variety of ways. And as Christina has already oriented our audience, to the fact that we try to really highlight how this change appears and where it appears in the February 15th, 2024 dated proposal. But our, our second takeaway being the hollowing out of instructional uh, requirements encompasses a lot of changes. First, we see changing teaching to the facilitation or facilitating learning. 
Um, and this is a pretty significant change and a change that we've heard a lot of feedback on from educators because it really appears to be hollowing out the art and science uh, of teaching and, and making it a bit more passive. We also see the removing of the authority of certified educators in ensuring that students are proficient and are learning and are progressing, changing the goal of learning from mastery to proficiency. And this too is also a significant shift. Um, there is a difference between mastery of content and skill and the proficiency of content and skill in looking at the achievement of our students and the achievement of competency. We actually see this as the lowering of standards. And then the last one that I want to highlight here on hollowing out instructional requirements is this hyper focus on individual students. And we don't want to say that that's not important. That is actually critically important. But for a solid instructional program, you need a system that focuses on systemic issues that lead to student underperformance, not simply individual student underperformance, and ways within the system um, and approaches in which that underperformance can be achieved by looking at systemic issues that are that are at play in a particular school, in a particular grade, et cetera. So let's think about how this may play out in Jack and Mia's circumstances. So for Jack, teachers in his school are concerned with the progress of some of his classmates because they received credit for an Algebra I class from an external organization, an organization outside the school. But the courses weren't rigorous enough to prepare Jack nor his classmates for the next course in sequence, Algebra II. Teachers are seeing many gaps in the algebraic reasoning of students really impeding um, student success in their Algebra II class. And then for Mia, Mia's mom is concerned about the watering down of New Hampshire, of how New Hampshire schools award credit because she has heard that universities Mia wants to attend don't feel as if they're rigorous enough. And with the alteration of the role of the certified teacher, Mia's mom is concerned for her daughter's future. Then jumping to our third key takeaway, and this is a takeaway that we, we have been tracking really since the beginning of this process, going back to 2020 and also 2022. And that is the removal of local authority. So the third takeaway has to do with the removal of local authority. This has been a long standing concern for reaching higher and one that we first raised in 2022 with our initial analysis. We see that the New Hampshire ED continues to remove district competencies, graduation competencies, and course competencies replacing them with a statewide set of 20 graduation expectations, one for each credit required leading to high school graduation. We see local graduation and district competencies completely removed, as well as course requirements in favor of these credits and graduation expectations. Ultimately, diplomas are tied to these 20 expectations, and it invites the question of what does this mean for high school credit? What does this mean for a high school diploma in New Hampshire? And will it impact student post-secondary pursuits? One of the other changes that we have observed deals with how the student demonstrates proficiency to earn credit leading to graduation. Under current rules, it's through an assessment approved by the local school district or New Hampshire ED approves an assessment if one has not been approved at the local district level. But the proposed overall adds a competency-based assessment option. 
The challenge here is there's no detail. Without any of this detail, definition, or authority as to the body that would approve the assessment, it's unclear what exactly this means or who decides on competency and credit. We know that competency-based assessments have been used by districts in the past and in successful ways. But we also know that under other programs, like the state's Learn Everywhere program, vendors create their own assessments without input or approval from schools, the local school district, local teachers, or even professional educators. So this development really draws into question the value of a credit and the value of a high school diploma. Finally, one of the other changes we're seeing is around the actual role of the school under current rules. High schools and districts create programs and determine how those programs lead to a diploma. The New Hampshire ED's overhaul would change that. If this proposal passed, high schools would instead ensure that learning opportunities lead to a diploma instead of determining how courses and credits lead to a diploma. While this seems like a subtle shift, it is a significant one for our public schools. So making this more real, and, and, and tapping into the experiences in schools that Jack and Mia attend. For Jack at the school district town meeting, the ambiguity of the new minimum standards is creating quite a bit of confusion and discontent among residents of that town and what their school is required or must offer. With these challenges to local authority and the ambiguity in the rules, tensions may manifest in our communities. And this ties to something earlier that Christina highlighted, and this is exactly how an inequitable application of these rules could transpire under this latest draft. For Mia, the Mia school board responds to her mom's request about concerns for competencies and credits. But the school board's response acknowledges or says that they no longer have the authority to adopt local competencies tapping into the level of rigor their community values. And for the fourth key takeaway, we observe lawmaking through rules. This section of our takeaways doesn't necessarily follow, follow the same theme of the other takeaways, but it is a terribly important takeaway the Reaching Higher New Hampshire team has observed and analyzed. We see shadows of controversial legislation being proposed in these rules. For example, the New Hampshire ED proposed changes dealing with reading instruction which has been a hot topic in the New Hampshire legislature and nationwide for years now. You can find that change on page 25 of the PDF of the rules document. And when we highlight this, we're specifically referencing House Bill 437, which was laid on the table in the New Hampshire legislature last year. But that is not the only example we're seeing of lawmaking through rules. Another change is the shift from shall to may in the program elements. And this may be one of the most significant findings or shifts we see. The program elements actually sit in the second half of the ED 306 standards. And to step back for a moment, the first half of the minimum standards really outline what public schools are and what public schools must offer. The second half are the program elements. They're content standards. They outline what those programs have to include from specific elements like interviewing skills for a business course, 
or planned activities that promote developing mathematical concepts from the concrete to representational and finally the abstract level in math classes. Those elements are required to ensure that all students, regardless of the school they attend, have similar opportunities in our state. But the New Hampshire ED's proposal makes a shift from the word shall and mandates may. This is a significant shift which could make those requirements optional. We highlight this change under lawmaking through rules because it has shadows of House Bill 1671, which was a highly controversial bill proposed by our Commissioner of Education in 2022. If that bill had been successful, it would have gutted the required subjects and content of an adequate education and would have had funding implications. Ultimately, the legislature did not move forward with this proposal, yet we see shadows of it in the ED 306 proposal in rulemaking. One of the other pieces I'd like to highlight and really end on with this key takeaway is the removal of the authority for the assignment of teachers in content areas outside their certification area. This, this flexibility and this authority is known as a minor assignment. And it is an important flexibility for our local school districts. In practice, it means that a biology teacher, so a teacher certified in the area of biology and providing instruction in biology, may also be assigned to teach a course in chemistry. And the theory there is that chemistry and biology are related fields and that that certification in biology has the requisite skills to also support student learning in chemistry. This is a flexibility and an important one that our school administrators and teachers have in, this, in their schools. This shift or this removal would significantly impact many schools across the state. And when we look at this change, combined with the state legislature's efforts to allow uncertified teachers in the classroom, as long as they teach part-time, this could create an environment where schools are required to bring in part-time uncertified teachers to teach in content areas that certified teachers are no longer permitted to teach as a result of this rule change. So that highlights a couple of significant examples of lawmaking through rules. And again, we wanna continue with our trend of really making this real for students in our communities and how this, this shift could play out in two very different schools for Jack and Mia. So in Jack's relatively small high school, his physics teacher also teaches algebra as a minor assignment. After the passage of, his, of this rule, his district will now be required to hire a part-time teacher, uncertified, to teach math instead. Because Jack's teacher can't have a full course load because of the removal of this minor assignment, he leaves the school for a neighboring school district. And then in Mia's school, a more well-funded, well-resourced school, Mia's school board is trying to balance the changes in the rules and what it means for their library staff. And that is, that is an example. And in, in speaking to the library staff, that is another example of lawmaking through rules that I didn't specifically highlight. But I should add here in offering uh, Mia's experience, hypothetical experience here, the role of the library media specialist has been dramatically altered in the current proposed rules. And that alteration occurs from really being an instructional specialist in supporting and offering instruction to students 
in research skills, in critical thinking skills, in assembling um, a report for a class, to a content manager, to managing the book, the print, and the electronic resources for the school. And so in Mia's case here, um, her library staff is taking on a different role. They want to continue to offer courses in media literacy and critical research skills, but the rules have shifted that position to where they're purely curating a collection for the school library. So with those themes, I think I'm now gonna pass this back to Christina, who's gonna talk about school funding implications. Thanks, Nicole. Um, and, and our last key takeaway has to do with potential school funding implications. But I do want to underscore that we're going to be naming some examples here. But these implications run through all of the previous four takeaways combined. This is really an undercurrent of the entire rule proposal. So in terms of school funding implications, there are a number of potential um, areas from the removal of the class size requirements to the removal of cross-references of the programs of studies, it's really unclear at this time how these changes will impact schools and will impact school funding. Um, you know, we see there's the removal of career education, which is a, a, a big change, particularly for our, our middle and high school students. Um, there, those changes, those shifts, from shall have these certain program elements in courses to may include those elements, as Nicole had stated so eloquently earlier, that those are are, are major, major changes. Um, you know, they, they, they're expected to have statewide funding implications. And especially when we think about the state being in the midst of two major school funding lawsuits where courts have found New Hampshire to be underfunding public schools by over $500 million per year every year, there are also likely to be local school funding implications. So without requiring schools to have specific programs and outlining what those programs are, we could start seeing some more discontent and disagreement from school boards, from residents, you know, at their town meetings, at deliberative sessions around what their schools can and should offer. So these are pieces, you know, this is kind of a thread that's being woven throughout. And when we think about our current context, where our courts are right now deciding major litigation around school funding. Um, this is this is going to be absolutely critical. So when we think about Jack and Mia, bringing that back to to Jack and to Mia, these school funding implications. So in Jack's school, that could mean that, you know, now that those class size requirements have been eliminated, Jack's school board has decided to merge two elementary school classes in his district. And so now the second grade class in that district has 34 kids for one teacher. Um, this is just an example, but this is something that we have been seeing in, in, in districts across the state for years now. You know, they're trying to figure out their staffing, they're trying to figure out their class size ratios, and the, the way that the state funds its public schools has, is, has a really big impact on those decisions. And so with that removal, I think it will have some, some pretty persistent and pretty large impacts on local schools. So for Mia, Mia's classmate, who would be a first-generation college student and has dreams of becoming a nurse practitioner, is unsure about what's next after high school. But with the removal of her school's career education program, she and her family aren't sure how to navigate the complex college application process. So with the removal of that career education, there are a lot of families, there are a lot of students who who use that education, who, who depend on that to know what to do next. With that removal, it's really putting Mia's classmate and Mia's classmate's family in, in a tough spot. So thinking about the larger potential outcomes, one of the things that we really want to emphasize here is that we are not pretending to understand what the intent of anyone involved in this process has been. 
What we are doing is thinking about the impact. We, when we look at these rules, we're asking what will be the effect of the proposal, not what they meant to happen, not what they intended. Really, what is the actual impact that's going to happen? So when we think about the out, the potential outcomes, really the big, the big takeaways of this, the current proposal really shifts the emphasis away from high quality teaching, learning and learner development and moves New Hampshire schools to a model where they merely certify competency statements and issue credits. Potentially this model challenges the validity of competencies and by hollowing out instructional requirements and developing programs based on academic standards that are out of date and really most of them are expired at this point. So, you know, there's an over-reliance on those academic standards, many of which are, are completely out of date. So furthermore, it appears that these rules take decision-making away from our communities and away from our locally elected school boards by offering little control over curriculum, instruction, and the approval of programs leading to high school to graduation and life after high school. Um, we can see, we see that it could create a market for um, third party companies to create uh, external credit bearing opportunities and removes the school's authority to vet those programs. And so there are a number of open questions when we think about all of these big changes, what's next? You know, we have a number of questions. Some of them are listed here, we're, but there, there are a lot of them. Top of mind is how will the State Board of Education address the inconsistencies and contradictions of the proposed overhaul? Some a number, this question in particular, um, along with a couple of others, are the most critical questions to be included because. It is absolutely necessary that clear and comprehensive answers to these questions are brought forward to, for full transparency and the public understanding of the proposed and related impact. So we see a number of inconsistencies. We see a number of contradictions. You know, what do they mean? What was the intent behind them? Why are they there? And how will the state board go about addressing them now that now that this initial proposal is in their hands? What is the expected impact on school funding? I think that is a major question that that the state really has to reckon with as they move forward in in this in this exercise. And then finally, how are student, parent and community voices going to be incorporated in the proposal? As Nicole had said earlier in the presentation, you know, there have been listening sessions, there have been educated review sessions, you know, there have been a number of folks who have spoken up at public comment periods at the State Board of Education, expressing concerns, asking questions and all of those kinds of things. And with the public, the next two public hearings, there, were, there are likely going to be a lot more public feedback. And so how will the State Board of Education and Department of Education incorporate that feedback into the rule proposal and what ultimately whatever, whatever else moves forward? So in terms of next steps, um, there is a public hearing on that first half of the minimum standard scheduled for April 3rd at 1 p.m. That public hearing will be held at Granite State College, which is at 25 Hall Street in Concord. Um, that it is, a, it is separate from the State Board of Education meeting. This is a standalone meeting. This is a standalone event simply for the public hearing on that first half of minimum standards really encompassing most of the things that we talked about today. Uh, the state, we've also heard that the state board has a tentative date of April 11th for that second half of the minimum standards, those program elements. So April 3rd is really the public hearing for what the rules that kind of define what is a public school, what do they have to offer, what does it include, what makes a public school a school, and then the second half is okay, what are those programs that are being required to offer? What, is, what do those look like? What are the details of that math program, of that arts program, of that ELA program? And so this is our best knowledge in terms of the next steps. From there, the State Board of Education will deliberate. They will likely go through the proposal 
they'll do all of their work, they'll have a vote, and then it goes on to the next phase, which is kicked over to the legislature. So with that, I think we have some time for questions and answers, but before I stop my screen, I did just want to share our contact information. Um, we have, we're on Facebook, we're on Twitter, we're recent, very recently on Instagram, we're on LinkedIn. Um, feel free to email any one of Reaching Higher New Hampshire staff members with any questions that you have. Um, all of this information will be published on our website. If you've registered today, um, for this webinar, we will be sending this webinar recording out as well as any other materials, um, and this will be available on our YouTube channel. So with that, I think we have a good chunk of time open for Q&A, which is going to be facilitated by Kelly, our, um, our PR director. And so with that, I'm going to stop sharing and maybe we can head into some Q&As. Fabulous. Thank you, Christina. Um, and we do want to take an opportunity to, again, thank you all for spending some time with us this afternoon. This is obviously a very important topic for not only folks who care deeply about public education, um, but really Granite Staters uh, border to border. This will really have a big impact on our daily lives. Um, so we do have a few questions that have come in. Um, so first and foremost, let's get some logistics out of the way. Let's uh, address where you can find a copy of the proposed changes. Um, we have dropped the link a couple times in the chat. I'm going to do it again right now. Um, the proposed changes and information about the sessions that Christina just talked about can be found on the Department of Ed's website. Um, so getting a, a little broader here, uh, we received a question about how these proposed changes could potentially um, impact a two-state school district. So we know that we have districts on both the Vermont and Maine border um, that span uh, both states. And I'm wondering if either you, Nicole or Christina, could speak to that. Yeah, yeah. So um, I'll 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 take a first pass, and then Nicole, please jump in. Um, I think that is a is a really I think at, under even current rules, it's a very nuanced discussion, right? And I would expect that putting even more ambiguity into New Hampshire's requirements would make those discussions even more complicated. Um, I, 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 I'll, I'll be the first to say, I don't know exactly how it would, it would work in those two state school districts, but, but introducing more ambiguity and more uncertainty in the rules in New Hampshire, I think would really probably further complicate those, those discussions for sure. Yeah, I would just say, I would agree with those thoughts. I know that those conversations, um, are already really tricky, as uh, Christina said, and I, I think we would just lean in on the ambiguity um, and the lack of clarity um, within these rules and how they, you know, may play out in school districts that it, it have student bodies from both New Hampshire and and Vermont or or New Hampshire and in Maine. So um, I think that is going to make those those conversations a lot trickier for folks. Awesome. Thank you. Um, we also received um, an inquiry about whether we could shed any light on um, the how and why the uh, rules were split into two chunks. So you referenced that early on in the presentation, and um, we know that we're going to have a couple different public hearings here. Um, can you speak a little bit if you are familiar with the why, and then also um, maybe just summarize a little bit what those two pieces are? Yeah, so I can jump in here and I, I want to start by answering this question um, that, you know, reaching higher New Hampshire is is not here to talk about intent and, and we certainly don't want to speculate on an agency's decision as to why, but I think we can highlight some facts um, that, that may um, offer some illumination um, to, to that format. And, and that would be, so the part one, the front half of um, the minimum standards for public school approval, um, really talk about the, the structure of school, um, the policies that have to be in school. And then the second part 
are what legally are called program standards. Reaching higher since 2022 has been referring to them as program elements as a way to avoid getting creating confusion with academic standards. And really the program elements are far more comprehensive than academic standards. Academic standards are what students should know and be able to do. And while the program elements speak to some of that, they also speak to um, things like instructional practice in a particular content area or um, a particular uh, arrangement in terms of the phys physical space um, for that particular content area. So they're much broader and encompassing. So that gives people a little bit of grounding of how part one and part two are different. But what I would say is the program elements currently have um, a member from the public, Christine Downing, leading some educator feedback or some educator input sessions on the program elements. So business education, English language arts education, social studies education, science, science programs, et cetera. And so that may be a reason for separating them. Um, the, the second item um, that we can detail that is also grounded in fact, although I don't have the exact document by my side, is when you look at the expiration dates of different sections of the 306s. And um, if my memory is correct, I believe some of the earlier sections, so those sections in part one, are expiring this month, whereas many, if not most of the program elements are not expiring. So there's a timing and I think an urgency piece there in looking at different sections of the rules that are expiring. Christina, I don't know if you have anything you want to add to that. No, that was a pretty comprehensive, that was a pretty comprehensive overview. Thank you. Thank you, Nicole. Um, so a question for you, Christina, when you were looking through the proposed changes, did you happen to um, notice or flag any inconsistencies with other standalone RSAs, other laws that govern what happened within um, school districts? Yeah, I think um, I think a lot of the inconsistencies we saw were actually um, within the rules themselves where certain terms would be taken out but then they would be referenced in other places so i think the the the, the pdf that that has been dropped into the chat a number of times there within that document alone you know there are cross references to things that were taken out um there are references to things that you know that have been completely proposed to be removed or added in or those kinds of things, kind of terminology flip flops. Um, so once all is said and done, like if you were to resolve all of those changes, there are areas where, you know, you could read one line and the way rules are written, you're supposed to be able to read them and then kind of just be able to go forward. They're supposed to be detailed enough where you can read them and say, okay, I understand what that says. But with the changes and the inconsistencies, like some of them have been removed. It's kind of like a weird, like a web. Um, in terms of with, with the RSAs, the inconsistencies with the RSAs, I think that the the biggest piece for me is that that shift from the what program elements shall be to what they may be. Because I think we start here getting into, okay, what is legislative intent when they set out these core content areas and lawmakers say, this is what an adequate public education is. And now it's up to the department to kind of fill it in. You know, now the department of education is kind of changing what that means. And so for me, that's one of the biggest areas that I have a, a, a big question about. I will say that state lawyers will be taking a very thorough look at every single line of these proposed rules when it gets to the joint legislative oversight committee. So one of the one of the steps in the rulemaking process is that state lawyers go through and they flag, okay, here's where it contradicts with state law if it does, here's what potential remedies might be and that kind of thing. So it will go through a very rigorous review. And then it will be up to the state board to really address those concerns. 
Fabulous. Thank you. Um, so a question for you, Nicole, regarding the, the process for approving these rules and um, how long they will be in existence. So we know that we're coming up on an election year. We know that the current um, commissioner of education has indicated that he doesn't want to take on another term. Question from the audience is whether or not these will expire when and if those roles turn over or if they will be um, in place longer than that. Yeah, so so that's a great process question. So in the rulemaking process, whether you know it's a rulemaking process by the New Hampshire Education Department or another state agency, it doesn't matter. Those rules are generally good for 10 years. So they're once they're adopted, they can be in effect legally for 10 years. That does not prevent a state agency, and in, in this case, the New Hampshire Education Department, to reopen rules to make adjustments. And, and we've seen um, that happen in the past. We, we have seen where folks have realized, oh, we need to correct course or we need an adjustment here. Um, and rulemaking is reopened to just make changes to, to small sections of, um, of a chapter of rules for for example. So I guess to summarize, they are good for 10 years, but that does not prevent um, revisions from occurring um, if folks decide that, that a, a revision is necessary. And it would go through the exact same process we're going through, through now. Um, maybe not quite as long in timeline, but um, some similar steps in that process. Fabulous. Thank you. Um, we also received a question early on in the presentation. Um, we mentioned that uh, there is an opportunity here. There's an open question about um, how and to what degree the voices of New Hampshire families and New Hampshire students can be involved in this process. Um, one of our guests today is curious if you have any thoughts or um, have heard of any efforts afoot to help bring those voices to the table, or do we have any thoughts or recommendations about how the, that perspective could be included going forward? Yeah, so I'm going to I'm just going to dive in really quick to say how important I think student voice will be in this process. Um I think it's one that's been um largely absent from this three and a half year process and it's one that I would, you know, I think Th these rules are going to directly impact students. They deserve a seat at the table to say, this is what we want from our schools. This is how my school can best help prepare me for my future, which is the purpose of, of school, right? Um, in terms of how that happens, I think I, I think it takes a, a, a large effort to make sure that all of these voices are heard. Um, all of these voices feel empowered to speak up. Um, and so, you know, whether it's, you know, um, things that, like that are happening directly at school, whether it's ride shares on April 3rd, whether it's, you know, the State Board of Education accepts written testimony as well. So, you know, you don't necessarily have to show up on April 3rd. You can write, you can write a letter. And so, you know, I know that 1 p.m. most folks are still in school. And so like, if it makes more sense to write a letter or that kind of thing, like I would, I would strongly encourage folks to have their voices heard that way. Um, but I just want to underscore how important I think family and student voices, and I know everyone at Reaching Higher shares that value. Um, and so I would just emphasize how critical it is. Yeah, I would just say that that is a value that underpins all of our work. Um, a, a diverse uh, student and, and family um, and parent and guardian voice is critical. Um, at the end of the day, we are, are talking about teaching and learning and, and the future of our students in our, our public schools. And so there should be ample opportunity for the direct consumers of uh, schools to have a critical seat at the table. So not just a seat, but a seat at the table where where they're valued and where they feel welcomed and where they feel comfortable in um, 
in voicing their perspectives and, and what they see as the critical elements to their, their local public school. Um, Christina highlighted, you know, April 3rd, you know, that is an opportunity, that is a public hearing for anyone from the public to come out and offer input um, to directly to our State Board of Education beginning at one o'clock that day. I do realize that, you know, transportation and distances and geography can present barriers to, to people being able to do that. So writing input and writing testimony is, um, is just as valuable and formally submitting that, you know, through the New Hampshire ED and the State Board of Education uh, channels. And then Christina highlighted things like ride shares. I think, you know, local school boards have an opportunity to have discussions about this and engaging their own communities. I think that's really important for local school boards to be, you know, tapping into the interests and, and desires and hopes of their of their local communities, ensuring that those those voices and those perspectives are represented in these conversations. I also, um, so just to kind of bring it home, I, I also want to say that there are a number of organizations and individuals, strong um, advocates for public schools uh, in the state that are that are working really hard to to engage those voices as well. Um, and so, you know, there, there are um, a number of groups, a number of folks who are really working in support of public ed and I think it's important to note their efforts as well. Um, but yeah, so I, I I think getting the word out is is absolutely critical for sure. Fabulous. Well, thank you both for your thoughts on that. Um, as we come to the end of our time together today, I just want to reiterate our immense gratitude to all of you who took the time to learn a little more about the process and the proposed rules. Uh, before the end of the week, we will be sending out an email to all of you uh, with a link to this recording, as well as the underlying slides. We've collected the questions that we haven't gotten to today. We'll aim to, uh, to answer those to the degree that we're able to um, and get those out to folks as well. Um, but again, we're, we're immensely grateful for your time, attention, and support of public education. And with that, we will give you a few minutes before you move on to your next meeting, and we hope you enjoy the rest of the day. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone.